I saw it on my TV set I heard it on the radio We're losing all of our energy And our fuel is running low Me and you, what will we do? Everybody wants to know Go slow They say that there's an even chance The world gonna dwindle on down And if you don't know how to walk You ain't gonna get around me and you, what will we do if what they say is so? Go slow. Cars and trains and airplanes, we'll never even see them. Gas and oil and plastic will be placed in a museum. And we'll stand and look by candlelight at wonders of the past. And wonder how it happened How did we use them all How did we lose them all so fast and Some folks say that the cities Will be empty where they stand And you and me, we're gonna be Digging in the land But I ain't got a clue What we're gonna do If there's no land left to grow Go slow Better go slow Gotta go slow There's no energy crisis It's just politics or greed, or whatever. We hear our friends and neighbors say it every day. We may even hear ourselves say it. Most Americans don't want to believe that the lifestyle we've worked so hard for is changing, and that the change is inevitable. What is an energy crisis anyway? Why is it happening now, to us? The Jacksonville Community Council Incorporated researched the problem. The energy crisis is a result of shrinking supplies of oil and natural gas controlled by foreign governments at a crucial time, the same time the United States is no longer self-sufficient. We cannot support ourselves at our present rate of consumption. And as consumption increases, our lifestyles will have to change accordingly. Like a death in the family, our reaction to change is predictable. Most of us are at the denial stage. Maybe some of us have advanced to the anger stage. The Kubler-Ross study on the stages of grief suggests that we don't believe there is an energy shortage, just as our first reaction to the death of a loved one is disbelief. Then we become angry. Why me? Why an energy shortage? Who's to blame? Whose fault is it? After anger comes the bargaining stage. We know there are changes coming, but we want to postpone them. One more summer of air conditioning. One more trip across the country in an RV. One more winter before we invest in insulation. The bargaining stage gives way to depression. How can we ever cope with the electric bill or the price of gas? We must finally accept what's happening. And when we do, we're ready to deal with the problem, changing what we must to live as comfortably as we can in a new lifestyle. Most of us still deny there is an oil shortage, or we're just angry about the whole mess and wish it would go away. That's when we let ourselves think about it at all. So let's take a look at just how bad the problem is. Today, half of our energy comes from oil and gas, about 20 million barrels of oil per day. That's a row of oil barrels from here to Seattle and back every day. Meanwhile, our nation is doubling its consumption of oil every nine years. At the present rate of growth, we'll consume as much oil in the next nine years as we've consumed in all of history. We don't want to believe this, but mathematics explains it. We know that one and one is two, two and two is four, 
but an increase in the growth rate is not just addition, it's exponential growth. One dollar placed in a 10% savings account will grow to two dollars in seven years, four dollars in 14 years, eight dollars in 21 years, and continues to double every seven years. A fixed percent of growth divided into 70 will give you the number of years it will take to double the quantity. We're consuming over 7% more oil each year than in the previous year, which is doubling our total oil consumption every 10 years. Even using the most optimistic estimates of oil, natural gas, coal and coal shale reserves throughout the world, we will double ourselves into exhaustion in 50 years. And that's if we could get fossil fuels out of the ground as fast as we can consume them, which is not possible. America has already consumed over half of all known U.S. reserves and is making up the declining production capability through imported oil. Now over 6% of the world's population consumes 40% of the total world output. It's estimated that the world's fossil fuel reserves consumed at our present exponential rate will be exhausted in 20 to 30 years. Agriculture has become dependent on oil for fertilizers, insecticides, and machinery. Industry makes plastics, fabric, and thousands of everyday items from oil. America's cars consume one-ninth of the world's oil every day. Do you really think that transporting one person to work in a personal vehicle is going to take priority over food and clothing? Let's get used to the idea that the way of life we've come to enjoy is going to change, is changing, and has changed. There's no going back. In 1979-1980, the Energy Study Committee of the Jacksonville Community Council, Incorporated, was charged with preparing a report on energy supplies and consumption in Jacksonville over the next five to 20 years. The report is completed and the recommended solutions will not be a surprise to those of us who have advanced through the several stages of grief to acceptance. But for most of us, we'll want to ignore it, get angrier, or just get depressed. The major problems cited by this report are shrinking supplies of oil and gasoline reaching crisis proportions. Jacksonville's vulnerability because of its dependence on foreign oil for electrical generation. Lack of leadership by government and the private sector. A business-as-usual attitude by city government and private business when changes are needed. A deficiency of mass transit services. Energy inefficient buildings and land use patterns. Inadequate conservation by individuals as a result of denial of the energy crisis. The solutions recommended by the Energy Study Committee are consolidate and encourage conservation efforts and provide leadership to the community through an energy commission. Expand efforts to diversify fuels to include seeking renewable sources of energy conservation by the Jacksonville Electric Authority. Reduce single-person automobile travel as much as possible. Increase use and services of mass transit and other alternatives. Promote energy efficiency in land use patterns, in new building practices, and in retrofitting existing buildings. It's estimated that the conservation of energy could save as much as 40% of our energy needs. This estimate presumed great changes in our way of life if through conservation we can steadily decrease our consumption of fossil fuels, we'll prolong their availability for our critical needs such as food and other basics we've come to depend on. Conservation is not very glamorous, but it is the best start we can make now. Sure, but who wants to be first? If I cut back and my neighbor doesn't, I feel gypped. If we cut back at home, Will industry do its part? How about the government and the military? Why does it always get dumped back on the little guy? If the answers don't come from the leaders, we have only ourselves to look to. Conservation has already begun to reduce the growth in energy consumption. 
one analyst estimates a 10% savings, most of which has been achieved by industry efforts, not individuals. There's so much more that could be done. Conservation is reliable. It is immune from cutoffs in supply. It has no negative effects on the environment, and it's cheap. It buys the U.S. time to develop new technologies and decreases our dependence on foreign oil. Examples of leadership in conservation are available. Portland, Oregon has found that conservation can improve the local economy. It created jobs in the manufacture and installation of energy-saving products. Money saved on energy went to the purchase of goods and services. Denver, Seattle, and Albany, New York have begun free downtown circular bus service. Davis, California has an effective system of bike paths. Franklin County, Massachusetts surveyed the community and found that 85% of the energy dollars left the area. Conservation measures are redirecting the dollars back into the county. Utility companies in California are preparing to implement zero interest loans for energy saving home improvements. The loans can be paid off monthly or in a lump sum when the house is sold. Utilities in other parts of the country are planning on doing the same. Though they must borrow money to make the loans, it's far cheaper than building more generating plants, and the payback is quicker. Solar water heaters and heat pumps, both currently available, save money and are more energy efficient than conventional systems. Jacksonville's Prudential saved 90,000 gallons of gasoline last year by providing van pools to employees. Jacksonville can successfully cope with the energy crisis if it accepts the crisis and takes immediate steps to conserve the energy it has. Ultimately, the failure to take action will be costly, not only to the individual's pocketbook, but also to the community's standard of living. The time for action is now, not by the few, but by every one of us and our government. In the words of Aldous Huxley, facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. I'm gonna get myself a candle, I'm gonna get myself a match. I gotta get ready, gonna get me half an acre. Grow a garden patch mm, Gotta get ready Can't you see Well, they're turning off the heat and the water Turning off the electricity On you and me No TV Can it be have to learn to walk, not ride. The dinosaurs all went and died, you see. So sorry, put the blame on me. Got to get my head together when these changes come along. I don't even know whether I've got time to sing this song.